Perceive, process, perform. Do you need inspiration for your practice? Or do you simply need to practice inspiration? With this series, we aim to do both. Give us 15 minutes and we'll give you practice inspiration. Pat Allen is founder of the Center for Advanced Dental Education in Dallas, an educational facility where he teaches surgical technique courses. He has published over 80 articles in the area of aesthetic surgical procedures and has presented numerous lectures and surgical demonstrations worldwide. In this episode of Practice Inspiration, he provides an overview of his insights on aesthetic crown lengthening. Okay, hello, I'm Pat Allen, and this morning I'll be giving a synopsis or brief lecture on aesthetic crown lengthening. So if we look at this as an example of the problem that we see with uh, patients who have a high lip line and a gummy smile and basically short teeth. And this has been called altered passive eruption, and this is a, a soft tissue problem essentially, or it might be altered active eruption, which is more of a bony problem, where the bone is at the CEJ and requires alteration for treatment of the problem. But I like to call this inadequate exposure of the anatomic crown because it's a more descriptive term of the problem that we see, and I think it makes a bit more sense when we use that terminology with a patient. And the treatment then is to remove this excess tissue, exposing the crown, and that's called aesthetic crown lengthening. Everybody understands that term and it's, it's widely used. I really prefer the term surgical exposure of the anatomic crown, and I will use that in explaining this procedure to the patients because it makes more sense to them. If we're going to have an idea of what to expect, we need to know something about tooth form and tooth anatomy. We need to know something about etiology, uh, something about uh, what causes this problem. So before we do any treatment, and we have a patient who presents in our office with a gummy smile, we need to go through a differential diagnosis to determine exactly what's causing it. And then each one of those particular items we need to understand more thoroughly and, and the cause of those items. We need to understand what teeth should look like, how long they should be relative to their width. And then the question comes up, at what age do we treat? So at what age is appropriate at the lower end of the scale? In other words, a patient who's had orthodontic treatment, at what age are they ready to have exposure of their anatomic crowns? And then we'll look at treatment methods as the final part of this lecture. So in, in terms of differential diagnosis, there are a number of things that might lead to the expression of a gummy smile. And one would be a skeletal problem that's called vertical maxillary excess. And this is then treated by orthognathic surgery. Uh, there may be an extrusion of the teeth, and this is an uh, alveolar bone problem. So we call it a dental alveolar uh, extrusion, and that can be treated with orthodontic therapy to simply intrude the teeth uh, back to their proper position. Uh, the inadequate crown exposure, as I described, uh, is treated with aesthetic crown lengthening. And a short upper lip, some patients have uh, ex exposure of excessive gingiva because they simply have a short upper lip. And in that case, there's really nothing uh, to do to treat that. Uh, excessive lip translation is different. That's a patient who can simply raise their lip higher than normal and expose more gingiva than would typically be exposed. Uh, some patients can wiggle their ears. Some patients can really lift their, their lip high. So this is just a, a personal a situation. Some people can be taught how to smile differently to correct that problem. Or you can use Botox to uh, alter the muscle activity so they can't excessively raise their lip. And then they can have an idea if that's something they'd like to have done because Botox, of course, is a temporary solution. If they like that look, then you can do a vestibular plastic procedure to hold the lip in position uh, to expose the proper amount of tooth. And then, of course, the last item on here you see is the combination. Very often there are several things that contribute to the expression of excessive gingiva. So we will look and see which one has the most important role and treat that one. What I want to focus on today is the inadequate crown exposure and aesthetic crown lengthening. So what is the etiology of inadequate crown exposure? Short clinical crowns, in other words, what causes that? What well, might be a soft tissue problem, just an excessive amount of gingiva covering the tooth, and that's easily treated by a gingivectomy. Uh, there may be a bony problem, as I mentioned. This is sometimes called altered, altered active eruption. And in this case, the bone is at or near the CEJ, and that leads to the soft tissue uh, positioning itself 
at a more coronal position on the tooth. There may be thick alveolar bone. So if there's an excessive thickness of bone, the tissue then has to come over that uh, bump in the bone. Sometimes I call that a speed bump. And then it will position itself more coronally uh, on the crown as well. And there may be a combination. Maybe there's a little bit of gingival overgrowth and a little bit of a bony problem. Maybe the crest is near the CEJ. Maybe it's a little thick. Maybe it's thick intradentally. Uh, there are a variety of different forms that fall within these categories. So if you look at what determines gingival level and, and group them and analyze them separately, bone level is probably the most important and the best understood. So if we look at this drawing, we can see that the normal position of the bony crest is about two millimeters from the CEJ, and it parallels the CEJ completely around the tooth. So it peaks intradentally in the anterior region. And then if we overlay soft tissue over the bone, we can still see the bone through it, we can see that the normal position of the bone crest and the distance of that position to the gingival crest is three millimeters. So if we're doing a surgical procedure, we need to know that if we alter the bone level to a certain position, that after healing, the gingiva will be three millimeters coronal to that bone crest. So this gives us a very precise ability to determine how much tooth we want exposed at the end of our surgical procedure. And then, of course, this is related to, if we look at a longitudinal section here, it's related to the biologic width that we well know, and that's from the bone crest as we move coronally, you need one millimeter for connective tissue attachment, one millimeter for epithelial attachment, and one millimeter for the gingival sulcus. So that's the three millimeter distance from bone crest to gingival crest on the facial aspect of the teeth. Now, the periodontal biotype is another issue. And if the bone is thick, as you see in this view with a full flap raised in, a, in the process of crown lengthening, you see relatively thick bone. And if I tip that patient's head back where you can see the bone better, you see an, an excessive thickness um, of the ridge away from the teeth. And we need to bring that bone back in close to the teeth with our surgical procedure so the tissue can then lay against the tooth. Otherwise, that tissue will not come up make a right angle turn to the, to the tooth and expose the tooth. It's going to lap a bit uh, further coronally. So this is a bony problem uh, in terms of excessive thickness. Tooth position is very important to assess because tooth position will, will affect the gentle level. So if we look at this example and we draw a line from the gentle margin of one canine to the gentle margin of the opposite canine, typically the gentle margin of the central incisors is at or near this line. In this example, you see that the right central incisor has a gingival margin that is a bit more apical. So, I'm sorry, gingival margin that's a bit more coronal. This is because if a tooth is in lingual version as that tooth number eight, the right central incisor is, then the gingiva will, will be in a more coronal position. Uh, conversely, if the tooth is in a more labial version, it's projected a little bit more labially as the left central is by comparison to the right, then the apical there'll be apical positioning of the gingival tissue. So if the tooth is lingual verted, the tissue comes down. If it's labial verted, the tissue moves up. So we can also look at that with crown contours. And if we look at an under-contoured crown, it would be like a, a tooth in lingual version. There'll be a more coronal positioning of the gingival tissue. And conversely, an over-contoured crown will drive that tissue more apically. So we have uh, tooth position and uh, contour of crowns to look at. This uh, crown contour issue is particularly important with implant crowns. Because with implant crowns, if you have an implant that's a little bit in, in uh, labial version and the crown of the tooth, the restoration is over contoured, there's no way that tissue can be brought coronally. You sometimes can overcome uh, this by having an under contoured crown that allows you to move that tissue in a more coronal position. So what are normal crown positions. If we're going to consider doing a surgical procedure to expose teeth, we need to have some idea of what the normal crown length should be. And in this example, this is a patient from my practice, and I have a, a probe on the central incisor measuring the uh, vertical dimension, and it's a 36811 probe, and it looks like that tooth is measuring about 12 millimeters. It's just the incisal edge is just past the black mark uh, at 11 millimeters. The width of this tooth is about 8 millimeters. So if you look at this critically, this is a case that's not been treated surgically, you can see that the teeth look a little bit long 
And if we look at dimensions from the literature, we can, we can see this. Probably the best study that looked at anatomic uh, or, or clinical crown length was Sterrett's study in 1999. And he looked at patients that were equal to or greater than 20 years of age, that had genital margin apical to the cervical bulge, and who had no attachment loss. He eliminated those patients who had the condition that we described as altered passive eruption, uh, any type of genital overgrowth, genital recession, or genital inflammation, and those patients who had restorations or incisal wear that might impact that, that dimension. So he's looking at absolute perfect dentition and what would the measurements be. And what he found is by dividing his group into the male and female population, the widths and lengths were different for men and women. For the men, the width of a central incisor was approximately 8.5 millimeters, and the length was 10.2. For the women, it was approximately 8 by 9.5, but in each case, the ratio was about 0.85. So the, the proportionality of the teeth were identical for men and women. If we look at the um, central incisor in a range, what I've done here is I've made this chart myself to give you the anatomic crown proportion, which is 0.75, and the clinical, which is 0.85. And then we've looked at a, a range of widths of 8 millimeters, 8.5, or 9, because that encompasses most of what we see in teeth. And to fall within the 0.75 to the 0.85, the length of a central incisor will be, be between 9.5 and 10.5 approximately. So this gives us a, an idea of what would be uh, appropriate. If the tooth is 8.5 millimeters wide, the range is 10 to 11.3. And if it's 9 millimeters wide, the width is 10.5 to 12. So what do you do with all these numbers? Well, what you can see is the common figure to all three groups is about 10.5. So if you wanted to remember one number for the length of central incisors, it would be 10.5 millimeters. Now, if we look at the position of, um, of the gentle margin in young patients, this was a study published many years ago, 1976, uh, looking at um, a cross-section of orthodontic study cast, cross-section of individuals between age 6 and 16, measuring their teeth. And what they found was that there's an increase in the clinical crown length of centrals and canines up till age 12, and then a leveling off. So it appears that 12 is a significant uh, age that pretty much the adult length of, of centrals and canines uh, can be seen. If we look at the 12 to 16 group, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 years of age, the length of the centrals is about nine and a half completely across that 12 to 16 year age span. The canines, it looks like maybe it took until about age 15 to reach that same level. It's, it's, it depends on the numbers in the study and so on, but it, it would look like that 15, age 15 might be a lower limit for uh, considering crown lengthening. If we look at a, a follow-up study that the same group did, a longitudinal study this time, in uh, subjects from age 17 to 20, they found that there was no change. It was approximately 10 millimeters for both the centrals and the canines. And if you look at the difference between that group the little bit older individuals and the younger group, it's about a half a millimeter of difference. So this would suggest that if you want to gain uh, clinical crown length by waiting to do a crown lengthening procedure, the gain's gonna be about a half a millimeter. And if you need more than that, you, you probably should consider doing a crown lengthening procedure, and age 15 is probably an appropriate age to do that. If we compare these numbers, uh, going, looking back at Sterrett, and you can see that he had a range of nine and a half to 10 in his group and approximately nine to 10 for canines over uh, a group of adults. So again, the difference between the, the figures is really uh, quite small. Now another important study that looked at this is a study by Konikoff and, and coworkers in Virginia. And they looked at pre-orthodontic and post-orthodontic crown mentions, dimensions on cast from 200 subjects. 31 of the subjects were examined five years after completion of orthodontic treatment. And what they found in a group that's centered around the adolescent age group is that the clinical crown length for central incisors did not change before and after orthodontic treatment. So there was no advantage in waiting till the end of ortho. And they found that clinical crown length for central incisors increased about a half a millimeter five years after the completion of orthodontic treatment. So their conclusion was 
that if there is a need for crown lengthening before orthodontic treatment, there will still be a need for crown lengthening uh, immediately after orthodontic treatment, and probably still a need five years after the completion of orthodontic treatment. So if you have a patient with short clinical crowns in an adolescent age group, it's probably a good idea to go ahead and treat at that, at that time rather than expecting an improvement with aging. So I've given you a just introductory portion of the lecture that I gave on aesthetic crown lengthening. I don't have the time to go in this brief uh, overview into the techniques, but that's covered in the full lecture and also application to adult restorative patients. So thank you for allowing me this opportunity to give you a, an example. Thank you.